May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Some of my very earliest memories as a child are of being in church. I grew up going to church pretty much every Sunday, um, so that makes sense. And even those cloudy, early, early, early memories of consciousness, I can still piece together certain vague images of that little country Methodist church that I spent so much time in in those first years. I remember the rough red brick exterior and the kind of chalky white uh, lines between where the bricks stuck together. I always felt like it was coming off on my hands if I would lean on the side of the church. I can remember getting in trouble for leaning on the church and getting my church clothes dirty. I can remember it being a mostly unadorned space. It was like a wood laminate, you know, fake wood uh, wall ex interior and very unadorned, um, other than just a couple of little pictures only of Jesus, um, particularly that one, you'll know the one, him knocking on the door. Remember that? And it was, there was some sort of mirror component too. I'm sure someone bought it at a Walmart. I remember the look and feel of those cushioned pews um, as they were always kind of a table for my coloring sheets if I was like sitting on the floor and doing something, not paying attention, or otherwise, just laying my head down, because it's, you know, it's an hour for a kid to sit through that. I mean, it's a, it's a long time. And I can remember the wooden communion table in the center in front of the pulpit. Uh, in the words, this do in remembrance of me adorning the front, I remember thinking um, about as early as I could read that they, had must, they must have gotten the words in the wrong order. So you can probably hear that a lot of what I recall in these earliest memories of church is a sense of fondness, and that is certainly true. But that wouldn't be the whole story, because of course there were things that ultimately would draw me away from the tradition in which I grew up. And one, of, one that stays with me, um, and I think about often, um, is from the perspective of that little boy, is in uh, the role of the preacher. So this preacher up front that I would be confronted with in this tradition. Preaching in that tradition was something more like an exercise in a pretty aggressive public shaming. The preacher's job was to kind of go up and stand in the front in a suit. It's always a man sweating and yelling at you for 45 minutes about how sinful you are and everything you love and the world around you is and how you'd be uh, better off if you got your life in order before it was too late. So not a lot of space in this kind of preaching for, for example, the kind of loving awe at the universe that the psalmist feels when writing in Psalm 19 today. It isn't that I can't kind of go back in my mind and reinterpret some of these preachers' motivations uh, with the knowledge that I have now. I understand what might motivate a person in that context to preach in this way, poor and working class, politically alienated, etc. But for me, just as a kid, I couldn't understand it. I was really repelled by it. Why it seemed that so much of what I was growing up to consider good and interesting and beautiful about the world was so anathema in the eyes of the church. And so, ultimately, I had to leave it behind. And I did for many years. Now, of course, the funny thing about that is, right, what am I doing right now? Being a preacher. So part of my story is having to become reconciled both to the parts of my story that I needed to leave behind at one point in order to survive and to grow into something, um, thrive, and the parts that I carried with me into the rest of my life and ministry, and indeed which I would say in no uncertain terms that God has redeemed in me, is making new for me. All of us have both of these parts of our story all of us are on some journey of figuring out what to continue to carry along with us and what we need to set down and leave behind. Sometimes things in our lives that we hold so tightly onto for years and years can become such a burden for us that we ultimately just have to let them go. And then 
On the other hand, sometimes things which we never thought we'd say or do or associate ourselves with come back around to find us. I'd be curious what comes to mind for you here. We're reminded in 1 Corinthians today by Paul that the body of Christ truly takes all kinds. The universality, the Catholicity of our faith is such that not only is there room enough under this big tent for everyone, and first of all, there is that, there is indeed room for everyone here. But even more than that, we are actually kind of incomplete without everyone taking up their particular specific role. Everyone bringing themselves and all that they have to offer to God. Paul uses this now very familiar metaphor that just as the body needs all these different parts functioning in harmony to live and to thrive, so does the church need its individual members to do the same. And of course that means us bringing our strengths, our resume items, the things that we usually lead with, that we like about ourselves, all that. But what we find is that much of the time, those parts of ourselves also, and our stories, that we might have needed to distance ourselves from those kind of hurt places or broken places in our story. Those are the things that God most wants to redeem and to use. Even if only just to say to someone who's been through what you've also been through, I understand. That is Christian hospitality as much as food and shelter are. Just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews and Greeks, slaves and free, and we are all made to drink of one spirit. I wonder what in your story do you bring to your life of faith with eagerness and readiness to share with others, and I also wonder what do you hide or obscure in your story because you think it might be unwelcome or not relevant. St. Paul, in another place, says that God's power is perfected in weakness. What a profound existential insight into the human condition. What power there is in the mutual sharing of weakness. Anyone who's ever been in 12-step can tell you that. Jesus, reading the words of Isaiah, says of himself, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The Christian story is very good news for our world. That story that Jesus reads in Isaiah and says, This is fulfilled today in me, in my coming. And it is a story of hope and deliverance and freedom. And we are the bearers of it, not always in our strength, but more often than not in our weakness, in the ways that we can share our personal stories of redemption, of those ways that God has seen in us and all of our chaotic mess, seen just that, and said, I can do something with that. Today, we may, may we give thanks for this and always remember that the way of life is to love God and love neighbor, and only by doing just that to also learn to love ourselves as made in God's own image. Amen.